comparing it to passages in Daniel and to Revelation and other various prophecies. And it sounded like they knew what they were talking about. And there was another teacher called Clarence Larkin that uh, I found out at that time in the late 1900s that came up with all these charts and all these things about how the, how the dispensation in the, in the millennial kingdom was going to come about. And oh, they were beautifully done. And he wrote a couple of different books too. Uh, but of course he's not mentioned too much among these, uh, these writers in these stages where I'm talking about. I just remember that in my own uh, studies at that period of time. So the whole thing was to take the focus, take the heat off the Pope as the Antichrist. That, that was the focus of the Jesuit uh, priests at the time, which is, of course, their job. Now that teaching may have faded into obscurity had it not been for this next guy, Manuel uh, Lacunza, that picked this up in the early 1800s. Hmm, very mysteriously. Kind of, kind of hard to say that it was a coincidence, huh? And he revived these teachings. And also, one of the things about Rivera was he, he's the one that started the God chose, God's chosen people myth. You know, the Jews were still God's chosen people, and they would be revived in, the, in Jerusalem and all that. And so that's where you get all the lost tribes in this, this country. Of course, England thought they were the lost tribe, and then the people of America, they're the lost, they're the lost children of Israel and all that. That's where that came from, too, from his teachings, right, right out of his commentary. But this uh, Lacunza, he was even a little bit more deceptive. This Jesuit priest, he assumed a Jewish pseudonym, a, a Jewish name that he wrote under. It sounded like he was a rabbi, and he knew. He dwelled into the ancient prophecies, but all he did was revise Rivera's commentary and bring, in, bring it into the focus of the 1800s, right in time for the revival of gifts, supposedly, that was taking place in northern Wales in England at the time, popping up in some of the Presbyterian churches, the signs and the wonders and the tongues. And, and in other words, that's where modern Pentecostalism was birthed. I think they even called it apostolic something, apostolic, uh, different things. But that was, that's the whole idea of modern, modern Pentecostalism came out of these early times. There was a few incidents before that. But this is the main one because this Scottish preacher named Edwin Irving he was fascinated by all this stuff in this end times prophecy. And he took Lacunza's work and he translated it into English in 1827. And boy, that picked up like wildfire during this revival of gifts period. And John Nelson Darby picked it up and that's where you get this vision that was supposedly took place with this, uh, Margaret O'Donnell person in, uh, in that period of time where she was supposedly laying dead, dying on her sickbed, and she received this, uh, this uh, vision from God that there was going to be a secret coming of Jesus that would precede this tribulation period that uh, these, they were reviving out of Rivera's teaching and then Lacunza's uh, re rewrite of it all. And it would rapture out the church, and then this time of uh, tribulation would come in which the Antichrist would rise and all that. That's where, that's where Darby came up with this uh, rapture of the church idea from this vision that Margaret MacDonald had supposedly during this time. I'm, so, I'm sure she had a vision because just like Joseph Smith, he also had a vision that came up with Mormonism, right? He was visited by the three personages. That was also in the 1830s. A very, probably a much, uh, you could probably focus on that time as a time of, uh, of because they were teaching so much false doctrine, there was so much darkness in the world, the Reformation didn't really reform doctrine and return it to its apostolic roots. All it did was reform Catholicism. So the beast that the head was to receive the mortal wound and recovered, and then the other, the other beast that deceives the whole world and creates the image, well, that's just two heads of the same monster. Catholicism and Protestantism, all teaching the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is the the substitution and the moral transfer and sins forgiven in advance, and you're saved in your sins and all that rest of it. So that, that's really what it all boils down to here. But so that's, that's what happened. John Nelson Darby was uh, in England at that time in, in Northern Wales and attended these conferences on biblical prophecy. And he was a Plymouth Brethren uh, theologian, by the way, well-respected at that time and still even in literature a well-respected uh, Bible scholar, so-called Bible scholar. 
And he picked up on this, and he's the one that came up then with the, with the pre-tribulation rapture of the church idea in, in his writings and teachings. So all this then set the stage. If you, like you want to kind of set the stage in a Hollywood movie launching us into the 20th century. 1909, we had, what, the Schofield Bible. The Schofield Bible then was where it brought all this teaching into the mainstream as valid theology called dispensationalism. Again, that's where that guy, Clarence Larkin, I was telling you about. That's where he came from. He was big time into the Schofield Bible. So many scholars picked all that up at the time, got in the Baptist and the, the, in the New Wave teachings at the time. And pretty much by 1957, most of the mainstream churches were teaching a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, I know since the 80s, they've argued about pre, pre-mid and post. They used to argue vehemently about that in those Sunday school classes, I remember back then. How foolish, when everybody was still living in their sins and they'd never repented to begin with, as we point out constantly in our lessons. But nevertheless, they were arguing about such nonsensical things, well, because it took the focus off their lives, off their, their behavior. So here we got the stage set in the stages from the 1500s where he wrote his commentary on Revelation, invented the whole thing, the Jewish chosen people, uh, the New Age, the millennial reigns, uh, the three and a half year tribulation, all that stuff. All that stuff came right out of his teachings and I'm telling you, Lindsay and LaHaye knew that. Then Lacunza picks it up in the 1830s revises the whole thing, and then they pick it up, that, that Edward Irving guy picks it up and translates it into English in the 1827. 18, 18, uh, and here comes along oh, Mr. Darby and comes up with this high idea that brings into the mainstream teaching the rapture theory. So by the time, like I said, by the time the Schofield Bible came about, which, of course, was many years later. It was 1909 when that, when that reference Bible was published. But by that time, it was already spreading like wildfire throughout the church, churches, the teachings. And, so, and all this is, is so familiar, if you look at it with unbiased eyes, taking the rose-colored glasses off, right, right out of this first Jesuit priest, that wanted to protect the Pope in the early days of the Reformation from the Protestant movement. Remember, it was very fierce. They were just coming out of the Dark Age and the bitter persecutions and horrible wars. Of course, the, the Renaissance had a lot to do with that, too, in the invention of the printing press in the 1400s. That's where I pinpoint it. But a lot of, a lot of theologians like to pinpoint the, it, it, uh, Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. But Martin Luther was nothing but another big heretic that uh, was murderous and, and hateful and, and all that kind of thing. But anyways, they wanted to get the focus off the Pope because the Pope was losing his supremacy in the European nations, especially in England, where they had major wars at that time. I, I don't claim to be an expert on English history, but there was major wars taking place at that time in that period of history that brought England into the Protestantism, eventually then translated the Bible into the King James Version in the 16, early 1600s. Under, under the uh, delusions of the Westminster Confession, of course, which all those, all those translators believed in. So that's where dispensationalism in this premillennial thing was mixed into these books into the 20th century teachings, up to into lifetimes like myself. Well, I'm in my 60s, so I can remember back into the 60s and the 70s, and certainly in the late 70s when I came into mainstream Christianity as we said, we came in from reading the Bible, came to a, a, a repentance and faith following Jesus Christ, and naturally just went to church and got into all that mess and started unraveling it. But in uh, the, one of the first guys that took, uh, took up the, the, same, this, the, the same deal here was uh, William uh, Eugene Blackstone that published a book in 1908 Prior, a little bit prior to the Schofield Bible, Jesus is coming soon, which sold over a million copies, which was, that was pretty big in, you know, in, in 1908. 
and that promoted all this teaching that he gleaned from all these, these, these different stages dating all the way back to the 1500s. And then, again, that paved the way for your Hal Lindsey or Tim LaHaye's on into the 20th century. That's why I say by 1957, most of the mainstream churches, uh, anybody that uh, was into mainstream Christianity dating that far back, would probably have been know, know about the, the book that was called The Rapture Question that was written by John Walford in uh, 1957 that sold very well, that promoted these teachings through the 1960s. So when Hal Lindsey published that late great planet Earth in the 70s, in the late 70s, early 80s, well, he beat them all. He sold over 15 million copies at the, at the time, which I'm sure it's probably sold 20 more million copies since then. He claimed in his book, and I remember reading it, like I said, I, I, I read it, and it was all discussed and debated throughout the churches at that time, and I was involved in that stuff. He claimed that the rapture was imminent, and Armageddon was just around the corner, and he was pointing to the European common market at the time, which people were buying into because the remnants of old Europe were seeming to combine in this European common market. It was just loosely political nonsense. It had nothing to do with any kind of prophecy, but it fit into his twisted understanding of all this that he gleaned from Lacunza and Rivera, which I'm sure he knew about. I'm sure he, as as a uh, man that went to a uh, seminar.